Okay, almost there. <laughs> so, okay, I think we are live now. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from today. Um, my name is Fanuel, uh, Chief Resident here at SAI. Um, very excited to welcome you all to our March 2021 um, seminar. Uh, and today we're joined by Claire Holsvisky, and I'll tell you a little bit about her. But before I do that, just a couple of key, uh, quick house, house ground rules. Um, we have quite a few uh, new participants, new fellows that have joined us as well uh, this, this cycle. Uh, welcome to you all. So this is very informal. Um, these discussions are really for us to engage and ask really interesting questions regarding the work that's being presented. Um, if you have questions, drop them in the chat, or um, you know, if you want to ask it, hold on to it. Maybe to till towards the end, we have plenty of time for Q and A. In fact, so just hold on to them. I'll be the moderator, and um, uh, you know, I'll I'll tell you guys. Hey, if you have any questions, please go ahead. But it's fairly informal. Um, with that said, okay. And uh, we host these every, at least once a month. And they're really a way for us to, we have both um, SAI and non-SAI folk presenting. So it's really exciting. And um, also have major events, uh, whether it's uh, pitch days with the fellows, all the interns as well. So definitely keep an eye and check back uh, on, on these. And they're usually all live streamed as well so that we can uh, share this with the broader public as well. So today, Claire, um, I want to introduce very briefly Claire. Claire is a communication specialist over at the Alden Alda Center. Um, and uh, Claire, you've been there for, for a minute, right? Uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, started when everything was going down, uh, in, actually yeah. in June of 2020. So. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, and, and not only is she there, she is also a communication officer at SAI. And so she is juggling multiple hats and it's been wonderful to have her um, with us. And ever since she's joined us, she's been very quantitative, asking great questions and really thinking through about our communication strategy and not just on the strategy community, but also on the side of communi science communication, asking very fundamental questions about uh, communication um, out there. And uh, she's also been involved with our summer program, thinking about uh, how to change it and and helping me also write the grant so Claire it's been wonderful to to have you on board and today she's going to be talking about her work on social media engagement and practices of faculty at land grant uh, universities which I'm really excited to hear more about uh, so with that Claire um, pass it on to you yes uh, thank you so much Manuel and um that was the bio and introduction that I had for myself. So that is um, right on the money there. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and hopefully I can do this correctly. Um, I learned, if we go to here, maybe, nope. And then if I hit that, are you able to see the title slide that I have currently going right now? Yes, we do. Okay. Awesome. Um, and ooh, let me change my headphones here quick. able to hear me again? Yep, yep. Um, I'm using the subtitle feature on PowerPoint for accessibility reasons, and I wanted to make sure if they would start working, but um, they should be up and going momentarily. Uh, but yes, no, I'm super excited to uh, talk with you all here today um, about some research that I've done. And I, um, it's fun to be kind of on this side of the camera and on this side of the screen. As much as I love listening to everybody's presentations, it's fun to present about some work that I've done myself um, on socially connected scholars and their engagement practices. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into things. Uh, overview for today's talk, um, I'll first kind of set up uh, the background and context for the study itself and then uh, move into the methods and data analysis that we used um, for our survey, talk through some results, um, as well as uh, point out some implications, key takeaways, and future directions for this research. 
um, and then um, I'm super excited to move into a Q&A and have a conversation with you all here. I do ask that um, it's, it's, it is hard to manage uh, the PowerPoint as well as um, the chat. So if I, questions do come up in the chat, I will, I will get to them at the end. Oh, I got, I got tricked into. Um, and so. <laughs> Uh, if you can please mute yourselves, that would be great for those who are attending live. Thank you. Go ahead, Claire. No worries. Um, awesome. And so in a time really when there's a lot of science related challenges and advancements that are occurring uh, that have major societal impact implications, communicating about science is critical, um, especially as we work to foster trust in and the use of science-based decision making within the United States. And so as the profile for science communication has then increased over the last few decades, there have been calls for many in the community um, from organizations and researchers um, to increase communication efforts. And these calls have come from, for example, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, as well as efforts from the Center for Public, and Research, uh, Public Engagement and of Science and Technology at the Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. Um, and so, but this isn't news. Um, encouraging scientists to communicate about their work has been long done before, um, as they there's a push for an effective communication about their work with the general public through different forms of science communication and science engagement activities. But the traditional way of sharing uh, information from sources of scientific authority to the public, um, for example, the researchers here at Caltech who are um, displaying their images that they found of the black, uh, the black hole to the public, um, this can be changed when we think about um, emerging online technologies that have surfaced. And so um, while this is all happening, the internet is um, surfacing as a source for both general and new specific uh, information regarding science. Um, just as more and more people are turning to social media platforms specifically for discussions on news, um, controversial and timely issues, as well as science itself. And so we see that those in the scientific community are more often now turning their attention to posting on social media as a form for science communication um, and scientific research. And so we see our friends at National Geographic um, posting about a science or a dinosaur tale that was discovered in amber. Um, and this post is actually on Facebook itself. And so researchers um, have found that social media is a, it offers a unique and different potential for science engagement and a two-way dialogue. Um, just as many members of the public are actually, um, who are not regular consumers of scientific information, um, they're able to encounter science uh, incidentally um, by it just appearing on their timelines, either from other people posting it or um, more likely what their algorithms choose to show them itself. Um, and the study done by the Pew Research Center shows that 44% of social media users in the United States say that they often or sometimes see science news that they wouldn't see elsewhere. Um, and so as social media and the internet really continue to be a rise and a key source of information um, for news and for American adults uh, about a variety of topics. It offers opportunities and challenges for scientists seeking to use social media to reach members of the public um, and connect with the broader scientific community through these platforms. Yet, uh, as scientists venture into the social media environment, much really remains unknown um, just how members of the scientific community view and utilize social media as a component of their roles as researchers. And so in regards to our study, we sought to examine the use of, um, we sought to examine this by using a census of scientists at land grant universities in the United States to assess uh, the social media uses 
and attitudes of a substantial cohort of scientists themselves. And in doing so, we're able to provide context for um, current issues and or the current increased uh, almost surge in social media that we social media activity that we see scientists partaking in, and also explore um, their attitudes towards social media and the impact um, that they have on their use. And this enables us to provide an insight um, into some potential areas of concern that are held by those who seek to encourage social media scientists to use social media more often. And so the data for our study came from a census survey of faculty members at specific land grant universities across the United States. The survey was conducted online from uh, May to July 2018. And our final sample consisted of 46 land grant universities that had a response rate of four, and we had a response rate of 14.1%. Um, but we wanted to better focus our analyses on uh, faculty scientists. And so we narrowed this, uh, the wider um, population to a specific sample based on the scientist's field of study and their tenure status. And so from this large pool of faculty, we identified scientists based on uh, the research areas that they uh, clicked into. Um, and those were based off of the National Science Foundation. And we limited our sample to those in the tenure track, um, either if they have tenure or if they're moving towards um, tenure in that track itself. And so, Claire, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about what a land grant university is? So land grant universities are universities in the United States who the land that they have their institution on was given to them um, in a grant. Um, for example, uh, UW-Madison is a land grant institution. And um, the reason that we chose these institutions is because their land was given to them, uh, we, there is a push at these institutions for higher levels of engagement um, with the public and kind of that sense of needing to give back to um, the public in the broader community of um, for the, using the University of Wisconsin-Madison example, the community, the Madison community itself in the state of Wisconsin. And we see that um, being pushed through and using the Wisconsin idea as a framework for that. Does that answer? Land grant? Yep, yep. Awesome. yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so to specifically test out the research questions that we had regarding scientists' use of social media, um, we used a hierarchical ordinary least squares regression model. And um, we had our independent, or sorry, our dependent variable here was exactly the level of social media for engagement um, and work related purposes. So scientists on a scale of like one to five, I, they um, were able to rate their level of how often they use social media platform, platforms for work related purposes. And then we had a list of independent variables um, that were grouped in different blocks and introduced to the model based on the um, assumed order of their causality. And so we started out, our first block contained their um, variables regarding their demographics and university position. Um, the second block contained the engagement uh, variables about the engagement environment that their uh, university has and the climate there. The third block had variables surrounding uh, scientists' motivation towards uh, engaging and their drawbacks to engaging. Um, the fourth block had um, questions about scientists' self-efficacy when it comes to and their ease of efficacy when it comes to engagement practices. And the last box contained uh, the attitudes toward scientists' attitudes toward questions about the attitudes toward social media and variables surrounding those. And so when we wanted to assess just where scientists are on social media, we know that they're using it, but wh what platforms are they using? and um, where are they gravitating to most often? We um, sought out and asked them, thinking specifically about your own research and scholarship, how often do you use the following social media platforms? And so on the left-hand side, we see a 
um, variety of different social media platforms. Um, and the percentages um, down below are the percent of faculty who use them either never once a month, a few times a month, or at least once a week. And um, we're able to see that Wikipedia, surprisingly, was a platform that majority of scientists gravitated towards most often, followed by Facebook and Twitter. And these, again, were the ones that you see scientists were using consistently on at least a once a week basis. Um, but also we see that YouTube and blogs are places that scientists are also gravitating towards and using most often. Uh, but what does this all mean? Well, compared to the public who can hang out on uh, social media sites like Facebook, we see that scientists might choose, uh, might be choosing engagement uh, platforms uh, where their colleagues are. And this appears when we look at um, the results of the restricted online communities. And for these, uh, think about like ResearchGate or Mendeley. Um, that we see that all scientists are more often choosing to go to those communities where the colleagues are compared to some other areas where the public might be and the opportunity to engage with them more. And so the question then that got brought up is, are these platforms being used to engage with the public specifically about science? And that's up to debate itself. Um, and so then looking towards the second portion of our research question, we um, did the OLS regression to predict um, research scientists' use of social media for engaged research. And I'll pull out some key, um, some highlights and some findings here from the final model of the OLS regression. So once everything's been, all the uh, variables have been placed in and ordered correctly, this is the results that we see. Um, we see that our overall model was able to explain 23.9% of the variance in scientists' use of social media engagement for research-related uh, purposes. And that means that when all of the independent variables are together, they explain about 24% of the variance um, in our dependent variable in this case. Um, and the bulk of that variance is built by uh, scientists attitudes towards social media, 14.6% um, of this variance was accounted for by that block itself, as well as factors relating to scientists' uh, demographics and their university position, 5.5% uh, um, of the variance is accounted for there. And then moving block by block, I'll briefly highlight some um, other findings and Unsurprisingly, we see that academic age is negatively associated to the level of social media use, um, meaning that uh, more often we see younger scientists um, who are more likely to use social media more often. And then when we zone in on um, the specific field of science that uh, scientists were in, those in the social, scientists, uh, social sciences, we saw a positive association there. Looking into the second, third, and fourth block, we see that uh, when a university treats public engagement as a core component of a faculty member's work, uh, scientists were more likely to have higher levels of social media um, use for engaged or research, engaged research use. Um, so that kind of hints at that institutional um, factors that can play into getting more scientists to use social media. Um, as well, we see a positive association between scientists' motivation to engage, as well as their level of social media use itself. And finally, we see that there is another positive association between the ease of efficacy and the scientist level of social media use, meaning that those who perceive engagement to be easier were then more likely to use social media to engage more often. Uh, and thinking back again to that second portion of our research question, I'd like to direct everybody's attention to this fifth and final block, the attitudes towards social media itself. And here we see that uh, holding a, port, a more positive attitude towards social media is positively associated to an increased use. Um, so scientists who think that there are interested late audiences online 
and that using social media increases your academic impact, thinking about citation rates, um, they were more likely to use social media more often. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, scientists who held more negative attitudes towards social media were less likely to use it as much. And in this case, scientists who use social media or think that it's too time consuming or that it doesn't increase your academic impact uh, were not found to be using it as often. And so really, what does this all mean? What does this research show us? Um, it shows us that the social media platforms that scientists choose to use, it varies. Um, that, and the, but then when we look at when faculty are on social media, there are factors that influence their level of use. And these levels itself, um, demographics, we find that it was consistent with other research specifically done by Besley and his team. Um, and the fact that when social media drops after a certain age is completely understandable. Um, and it's, research, or it's uh, reasonable to assume that uh, older scholars relative to younger scholars may be a little less willing to engage in social media given the added stress of learning a platform. Um, I wouldn't consider myself old at all, but I know with this new app that came out, the Clubhouse app, I am very reluctant to get on there um, just be, unless there is a tutorial that comes out soon. <laughs> I'm just telling me what exactly it is and how to use it in itself. Uh, so we see kind of that finding come through here. Um, and then when we look at the fields, uh, there is a larger push for social scientists to be uh, engaging on social media uh, more often comparable to their um, life sciences and applied sciences um, counterparts. Um, I would like to also uh, talk briefly about this finding that we see that is again previous with others or consistent with other studies um, in the faculty's perception of self-efficacy that influences their use of social media platforms. Um, the fact that this relationship wasn't bigger and a more consistent predictor uh, might be important that it could be taken into account to factor that scientists uh, may be still using social media frequently regardless about their own beliefs and engagement skills. Um, and this comes into play when we think about uh, communication training that scientists are more often now going through. Um, and not surprisingly, a key goal of communication training is to increase a scientist's uh, self-efficacy. Um, and one can argue that uh, if a higher, quali higher quality use of social media is desired, um, again, especially as communicating effectively about science is critical, um, the goal of communications trainings then should maybe be adjusted to strengthen a scientist's belief in their own skills and help them become more comfortable with engaging with audi real audiences online. Um, Alternatively, we might come to prefer that scientists uh, with lower engagement skills still remain willing to use social media, but move to platforms that have lower visibility or the stakes aren't as high. And then um, finally, focusing again on, on that positive attitudes note um, towards social media, this was consistent with other research that we saw done by Grudz and their team. Um, their research used the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology um, as a framework to study scholarly intentions and in their use of social media. And that model itself helps us explain the results of this study, indicating that attitudes and effort tend to show a more positive association with inattention um, to use social media itself. But I'd like to pose this question too, um, in that, this was an exploratory study um, about the effects of social media and engagement related factors. Um, and there are definitely other factors out there that contribute to scientists' uh, so use of social media. Other studies have found that faculty's perception of the audience, as well as their willingness to engage and prior engagement activities may influence social media use as well. Um, taking into account what we've been through in the past year um, and that any type of public engagement um, has done, been done so on, in an online format. 
And so it would be really interesting to see how the results of this study would have changed given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that the question becomes, are more scientists turning to social media to now engage with their peers and the public compared to other um, practices of public engagement? And so our results in the end suggest that there is an optimistic view for the potential of social media to spark further uh, science and public discussions, but it, th that may be premature. Um, especially as science continues to make its way onto social media, it's really important to reflect on where we are as a community and limit any expectations for the future of these platforms as a science public forum based on how scientists are using uh, social media right here, right now. And so overall, uh, by understanding how scientists currently engage with social media, we can work to establish more effective pathways for uh, communication and identify potential areas of concern that might arise in the future. And with that, I would like to um, give thanks to my co-authors, uh, Kate Rose at Dartmouth and Dominique Broussard um, in the Department of Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And thank you to our collaborators from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and the Mortgage Institute for uh, Research at, um, for their funding in this survey and this project. And with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing quick and I welcome any and all questions. Great, thank you, uh, Claire, for that uh, overview and uh, uh, review of the study. Uh, the floor is open for Q&A. I, I, I'm, I'm host and I have lots of questions, but I'm going to be refraining as much as possible. So please go ahead, unmute yourself and um, uh, ask away. Gabriella. Yeah. Um, so I, I noticed that you have like Wikipedia at the very top of that. And I'm just surprised. So I'm just wondering, uh, what is it? that they're sharing on Wikipedia, because to me it's more like a, like a static page reference, but it's not like, I never thought about it as a social media. So I don't know, maybe you can expand more on that. Yeah, um, that was a surprising result for us to find too that, um, and when you think about scientists at academic institutions who are teaching and encouraging their students not to use Wikipedia, um, they're like, hey, what's going on here? Why are you on Wikipedia so often? Um, but we, we found um, doing some brief analysis and some brief looking into this that um, when scientists are on Wikipedia, a lot of times they're searching for information, um, using it to engage with others uh, in terms of other colleagues that have done research in itself. Um, but it's Wikipedia is a fantastic forum for introducing a topic or introducing a subject of information. Um, when you think about like how you're gonna write a research paper or if you're studying a topic, Where's the first place you go to get an informational overview? Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia then lends you to other sources, other uh, peer reviewed published sources out there where you can gather more information. And so um, when, when we see this result of scientists using Wikipedia, um, it has kind of some positive associations with it and that they're there, they're here to correct any misinformation that comes about on their Wikipedia page or page of um, the researches that they're looking at um, and then potentially sharing it out as another resource is as well. So Wikip I will say Wikipedia is not at all that bad. Um, they do a really, really good job of uh, fact finding, fact checking. Um, and so uh, not that I would suggest citing that as a source ever, but do use it to kind of branch into the um, other fields of science when you're looking for information. Thank you. Claire, this is really amazing work. Um, I don't think I've seen like a comprehensive analysis of this. I have a ton of questions. So I'm gonna give you all my questions. I can put them in the chat too. But um, my first was, is there anyone doing analysis of science trainees and their um, sort of social media engagement? And then two, I was wondering about content analysis. If anyone's gone through like the faculty members that you surveyed like actual content analysis of 
what the tweets are and what they're putting out. And then third, objectively, like has anyone looked at the number of followers people have, like the number of retweets? Um, I know that there's a lot of journals that have the PlumX metrics that are linked to the actual journal article that sort of gives you a score for how like socially engaged your article is. And then the last question is about recruitment and using social media as a perhaps different approach to recruitment um, of like hiring a postdoc or advertising a job um, at an academic institution and how that could potentially change the demographic of the people that you bring to the table. So oh. sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> And I definitely would appreciate, I know I'm not going to hit upon all of them, um, or I will try to hit upon all of them, but I did forget some of them in the mix. So um, as I work one through one, if you can just refresh my memory on some, that would be fantastic. Uh, but your first question about trainings and things, uh, like studying uh, social media, um, there are there are trainings out there to help scientists become uh, better communicators, especially using different media forms, um, social media in particular, uh, but the studies afterwards, it all depends on the in institution or group or um, freelancer who is offering those trainings and if they have any materials uh, backing up, kind of uh, providing some like sources um, to see that an analysis of their training on if it was useful and effective. Um, and that's a huge topic of conversation going on in the science communication training uh, kind of field itself is that we'd like a little bit more, uh, some more studies done on the effectiveness of our training. And so, um, and I will say too, a lot of the questions that you come up, that have come up, um, that you brought up in this research itself, it's still being explored. There aren't very many studies out there right now that look at social media in particular and how scientists and faculty are using social media. So that's why ours was just an exploratory of this question has been floating around. Why hasn't anyone done it? Well, it's kind of hard to get to the data sometimes. We have the data, let's move into it. Um, and so there needs to be more studies on uh, what's going, how people are training others on social media and if it's effective, um, but those are still to come yet. And then when we look at the content analysis of social media, um, those are still surfacing as well. There's researchers out there looking at exactly what are people putting out there on Twitter? Um, is this information helping or hurting um, science in the field itself? And so those are unfortunately still to come, but stay tuned. <laughs> it's interesting because I recently was having a conversation with some people about a lot of labs, new labs have Twitter accounts for their lab. And people were sort of joking that science, professor science Twitter accounts are either like one, just saying that they got every grant that they applied for and seem like really unrealistic. Two, that they are getting rejected from every grant that they've applied for and it sort of like normalizes the rejection to people. And then three, just like tweeting like random, like, oh, look at this cool paper, look at this cool paper. So it, that's like very generic and very anecdotal, but it's sort of, you can imagine that it can be used for not just like conveying scientific information, but making people feel more included, more heard. Um, so it's interesting. Definitely. And your point about um, new accounts that have surfaced, um, it all depends on, and I, when I first joined SAI, our big push was what are, our, what are our communications goals? What do we want to talk with a potential public or publics out there? What do we want to talk with them about? And so uh, when, you, when you're starting to build your own social media, I'm not gonna use brand, um, so to say, but when you're starting to build your own presence online, you have to think about yourself, what, what do I wanna accomplish? What do I wanna change? And what are my goals? And who are the audiences that I'd like to reach um, with my goals? And so maybe it's, you just wanna get some information out there. Um, and so you're tweeting any paper and every paper that you come across. Um, in hopes that others in the field that you're in find helpful and useful slash Twitter is a phenomenal community slash way to just get information out there. Um, I always encourage my uh, some undergrads and interns, if you want any information on science communication, I will send you to Twitter sometimes to look at what's going on and get the feel of the conversations that are happening in the field. Um, 
But again, that all stems back to what you'd like to do. If you'd like to work on engaging with others, um, maybe it comes with posting like a science of the day question or some um, feelings about a recent thing, big thing that's happened in the news. And you can start kind of a thread of discussions on that front. Um, it all depends, unfortunately, but fortunately, <laughs> it depends. Um, and then your third question, uh, looking at followers and retweets and scores. Um, could, you, could you elaborate on that quickly again? I was just curious what you thought about that. I think a lot of journals are compiling these like um, metric scores about how, how much a paper is retweeted or posted on Facebook or emailed and what that means. Like, does that necessarily mean it's a good paper? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, That's a definitely a good point. I think that it's really, it's nice to see that journals are incorporating those metrics more often because um, it's, a, it's a nice sense for the authors to know is my spark is my research and my paper sparking conversation in a field, um, and so yes, altmetric. Thank you, um, Fanwell. That's a, a nice. Uh, I know uh, people will use that quite often just to see kind of where their research is going and track um, it that way. And I definitely would encourage everyone to use um, that metric more often and just doing a simple search about your research on any social media platform um, is useful, and you can see what's being associated and if. Um, people are taking away the things that you want to, them to take away from your research itself. Um, and then I know some colleagues um, out from University of Wisconsin-Madison are looking at um, kind of the level of engaged scholars and if they are tweeting and super active, where they had it, where are they compared to the rest of their peers. Um, so unfortunately that sits in the category of still to come. So I'm sorry, I can't pr uh, talk more about that, but um, there, are and there is um, still some more research out there. Um, and I, I do wanna talk about your fourth question here where it's using social media as a recruitment tool um, to change the uh, demographic of people that come to the table. That social media is such a great tool. I encourage anyone and everyone to, if you don't have an account right now on a social media platform, um, if you, since we're all, we're all scientists here, I definitely encourage you to just start a Twitter account, especially um, for the fellows um, when they are working on their projects. Um, and I would love to sit down if you'd like on one-on-one -on -one and talk about an engagement and content strategy that you could use for your projects, but those are to come. Um, but social media offers the opportunity. You have a wide and a broad community of the public almost at your fingertips, basically. Um, it's a international tool. You can talk with anyone across the globe. Uh, there's multiple conversations happening in every single like, different field. Um, and there are ways to encourage and engage others that you normally would not communicate with. And so, um, again, there are more effective ways to reach those populations. And sometimes we always have to think about am I the best communicator for the message that I'm trying to get across? Um, but it's more likely than not, I, it's, we need to be out there. We need to be encouraging other audiences to be out there. Um, and I will put the caveat to you that not everybody has a social media account and internet access as though it's getting a wider use. Not everybody is on there 24 seven. Um, so we still need to keep up some other lines of communication and other forms that we have been using in the past, but social media does provide a wider opportunity for a larger audience itself. Yeah, so we have an additional uh, comment by Rosario. Um, so um, Max QD, QD, QDA is another resource uh, to use uh, on top of all metrics. Um, thank you, Rosario, for sharing that. Um, other questions? I had one question. Sorry, I came in a little bit late. So if you if you mentioned this earlier, then I apologize for the redundancy. But I wonder if uh, maybe that question of utility might relate to the phase of uh, like career trajectory people are at. If everyone in the in the survey that you did was tenured, I can imagine that they're using it very differently than if they're at the postdoc grad student level. Can you, was, were these specifically tenured folks? These, um, our study specifically was tenured or tenure track. 
Um, so those who are who don't have tenure yet. Um, but yes, there are, we see a whole line and there's some colleagues out there who are specifically looking at graduate students' use of social media. Um, and we're, we're finding different things. People, tenured track faculty are posting about the studies that they've done and webinars that they're posting in, but graduate students are talking about the research that they're doing. And um, like Jess said, they're showing, kind of putting a personal side to science um, on a form and showing uh, either mistakes that they've made in the lab or having, if you see the hashtag on Twitter, academic chatter and um, engaging with other peers in the academic community. Um, so it's totally different. People are doing different things on social media, but it's so great to see the dynamic um, kind of duo between the two and how it's uh, the spectrum that people can use social media for. I was really glad to see that you included those uh those attitude kind of <laughs> questions before as part of the survey. I'd be curious, if you do stuff like this again, I'd be curious to know if you if you had access to, to ask hiring committees this yeah. or like somehow frame it in like the recruitment like trajectory. I know lots of people say like, oh, it's like super great that you are like really engaged in social media. But then when it comes down to hiring decisions, I mean, it's one of these broader impacts things where like, yeah, everyone's supposed to do it, but nobody cares like when it comes down to actually like bringing people into a department. So really interesting stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I really, I second that point of if you have somebody who's out there and putting time and effort into a fa fabulous blog on neuroaesthetics and they have a whole YouTube channel out there that's work that they, that scientists is then doing to engage the public with their own research. It's in, I would love to see um, even tenure committees take this into account as well. I think uh, to, to Kate's point, um, if you start connecting it, for example, to citations, um, I think that would get fascinating with the hiring committees in tenure committees, right? If let's say faculty that are more on social media get more citations, right? And I, I don't know if that's a, you know, people have looked at that, I think that people will definitely be <laughs> paying more attention and saying, oh, okay, there's I didn't get on this. Yeah, there's definitely that like Twitter famous academic class that I, that, yeah, it's a super interesting uh, corollary potentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So lots of, yeah, lots of, and I think to, to also uh, add on there, the way that um, I guess in this pool, it sounded like there were tenure faculty, uh, I know the tenure track perhaps, um, you can, I don't know if you broke it down by men and women to other demographics and how they're using social media and the differences there. Um, you know, yesterday we had a different session talking about uh, uh, that a little bit, but uh, do you have any sense of that? Are we able to break down the data further? Uh, oops, I just lost, there we go. I'm double checking and we did break down. So we did um, pull out the demographic of gender and seeing mm -hmm. if uh, males or females were using social media more often. And in this case, um, it was not significant, but we found that there wasn't a difference between male and female. Um, but uh, again, looking at our sample specifically, that's where it is. But I would like to know, again, and I follow kind of your curiosity here is what, what's going on out in the field? Are more men using them, are more females? But I think also having that balance of that male to female ratio is a good thing. Um, and yep. something that we should maybe continue to encourage as well. Yep. Um, yep. And yeah, looking at other demographic variables that impact that, that would be a really great follow-up study, so. Uh, so question from Jackie, uh, let's see if I, and, and Nisha as well. So Jackie, what are your thoughts on the effects of social media on funding opportunities? Um, thinking specifically of the heightened awareness and of funding uh, for insect biodiversity, for, in our case. Um, uh, so yeah, any thoughts about that? funding opportunities? I think social media is a great place to find funding opportunities and a great way for organizations um, to push out opportunities that they have on social media. Um, when we think about a lot of jobs, especially in the science communication field, a lot of job postings come out. Um, a place that you can find them is on Twitter um, itself. And so if we follow in that footsteps um, is post grants that are available, um, it's content for the organizations to have a, um, on their pages, but then also it's the opportunity for those who don't know to go and search grants.gov. Um, 
to find other opportunities in itself and places to apply. And so I, it's a fantastic tool. I encourage people to do that. And when you have other sources, not even funding sources, if you have other resources that you find online, share it out. There's a whole community out there who has the same questions that you do. Um, and co-working that in that space together is very beneficial. Yeah. And I think to add on as well, the the program officers of foundations are usually paying attention to also what discussions are taking place. And, and just to, to tag on uh, Jackie's point about you know, intake biodiversity, if, if, for example, there's a massive engagement there on that topic, I wouldn't be surprised if these program officers are paying attention to that and saying, hey, this is something we should look further into. Should we put an RFA, right, a request for uh, propo- RFP, sorry, request for proposals in this area? Right. So I think social media has that potential and they're all out there. Some people are even on these program offices on the platforms just to pay attention to like just look for signals. Right. So there is a potential avenue there. Um, let's see. Nasha's question. Let's see. So maybe if we start using metrics, justifying the efforts of using social media and the benefits for the research projects, uh, then the systems, um, institutions, funding agencies may also engage or accept more of the potential use of social media. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, do, you, do you have comment, additional comments, Claire, on that? I, you were thinking along the lines of how I would like to be thinking as well in that um, if we're putting more of an effort out there to communicate about our science in the field um, and using social media to do that, uh, I, I would love to see the grant process take that into account and showcase that scientists are out there and actively trying to engage about their research with different communities and they're doing so online. Social media is a powerful and impactful tool. Let's start boosting those, um, that impact. And so um, yeah. and I think that's something that we should just start doing right now to get the attention of uh, grant funders out there too. So yeah. projects that come up, start tweeting about it, start sharing, um, post Instagram videos, post YouTube. Um, SAI does great one minute little explainer videos. Uh, those have the power to reach multiple audiences and they show when we write grants that we're making an impact in our community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other additional uh, questions, comments? Um. These are all fantastic questions too. Mm-hmm. And I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this just with a community of individuals who are, I know that you're on, you're on social media, you're doing stuff out there. And so it's really fun to talk about this stuff with you all. Yeah, the, the big thing that we always come up with is evaluation, right? Uh, uh, how do you measure impact in this space? And Jessica already kind of mentioned this, but it's a big thing that, it, to also Nasha's point, right, and Kate earlier, like if you can attribute uh, specific benefits, specific changes that have taken place, right? Uh, retweets equal whatever, X number of extra citations for your study or engagement, right, conversation, right? And even better, coll- new collaborations that you have you have made because you are in there. I, I, I can't believe how many people I've met on Twitter that I've connected and suddenly that relationship blossom into a collaborative grant that we are writing together. So it's tracking it <laughs> and measuring it. That's the hard part. It is. And, um, so yeah. yes. Let's see, any other comments? Um, this study, are you almost gonna publish, is submitted or in process? In the review, or we're writing it up and then it'll go into review process. Um, okay. To, uh, kind of take it around a few conferences or take it around and present it at a conference um, coming up this fall. But um, Great. It's, a whole, it's, it's a springboard. There's a lot more to look at. And so having it's, we just got to get this portion out there itself. So yeah, yeah, very, very excited. We, had, we did have a, a intern last summer that looked at the other side of this equation, right? Social media is one little nugget in this engagement spectrum. Podcast is another. And of course our fellows are building everything they can think of, right? <laughs> the whole spectrum of things um but but i think that social media is going to embed in all of it because we're trying to communicate what we're doing and how we're doing it and making these connections so it's always back to the question about how do we track these uh, these impacts in this domain so um our girl of lean is uh i guess making a comment it might be nice to talk to people to understand why people tweet yep share 
reshare qualitatively to understand impacts and define what tweet, retweet, et cetera, mean. I think that, yeah, qualitatively, right? It actually talking to people. Uh, care to comment? Uh, yeah, um, I think too, and this whole kind of notion of the difference between a like, a share, a retweet, um, it depends on person. Um, but also I, with the algorithms that are um, caked behind in social, in social media platforms, um, any type of engagement, all three of those mean different things algorithm wise. And so uh, for example, on Instagram, they have a whole, when you, they have the option to also please excuse my cats are scratching at the door outside. So if you hear them, I'm, I'm a great cat mom, just trying to focus on everyone here. <laughs> Um, but yes, so for Instagram, when you, um, they have the option to like, uh, you can share, you can comment, um, and then you can bookmark and save. And we see that the algorithm are favoriting and putting posts higher on a social media platform when people are bookmarking and coming back to the post itself. Um, and then when you share a post, um, it's kind of second, the algorithm pushes you second. And third, when it comes to comment and likes don't mean as much compared to um, any of the other in kind of that engagement factors itself. And so um, I think when it comes to the quality and kind of the definition of what it means to do engage with different social media content, it's going to depend on how the algorithms uh, view that content and how it, the algorithms then will eventually change and adjust. And so I, I will still encourage you to, especially if there's science con creators and science content out there, um, do engage with their work. They spend a lot of time uh, producing content that people will like. And so giving them a like, a share, a comment, it's, they like to see that. That kind of shows, it's like an audience after a show when you clap, hearing that the audience uh, cheer for you as a performer and an actor, that kind of motivates you to continue. And so um, we just need to do a good, a better job of that as a community and engaging with content that's already out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one on a, on a just on a closing note, um, uh, I really admire what SpaceX is doing, especially on on YouTube, where they're showing us um, full view uh, their successes and most importantly their failures, right? Mm -hmm. And the way they're framing, like, listen, this is actually not a failure. In fact, I would phrase my comment more of a, this gives us an opportunity to learn something new, right? And it's that, like, this, the, the, the scientific process uh, whereby if you're showing, you lend someone into that process of thinking, right? The areas where you change your mind, right? We don't have to just share, hey, I got this paper, look at this paper, but hey, actually, this result didn't work today, Okay. Um, and you, you might be surprised at the, the people who are following and trying to understand better what happens behind closed doors, right? In those cold rooms and so forth and under the scope and so forth. So I think Gorilla Lean is very, is on point here. We need to be talking to people as well, not just looking at the numbers, but talking to them and asking. So when you retweeted this, why did you do it exactly? <laughs> very hard to do, but uh, I think it's a must. Uh, with that, I thank you so much, Claire. Um, it was, that was very insightful, and uh, we look forward to getting this paper out there. We can dissect it further. Yay, quick clap there. Uh, um, we are going to continue on with our series. Next up will be Amy on April 3rd, uh, who will be leading a workshop, okay, this time on seven ways you can be more engaging, confident, and compelling speaker. This would be something uh, a bonus for our fellows, but every for everybody, you know, being able to speak well, uh, communicating as a huge component of communication is really important. And Amy is an expert in that space, so keep an eye out for that and other event that we may be posting up soon. And uh, I 